Hello and welcome to Keys News. I'm Nicola. And I'm Ed Tyler. Coming up on today's show, we have all the information on this week's Eating Disorder Awareness Week. We have the latest sport with Gerard. And Doug will be here with the weather. So now, first up today, pancakes. It's pa been this week. It was pancake day yesterday. Did you make some pancakes? Uh, not me personally, but it was my flatmates. They made really good. All right, what did you put on them? Uh, just Nutella. I know it's boring. Oh, really? I had really nice uh, crunchy chocolate spreads. Have you mm -hmm. ever done like pancake art or anything like that? It was in the past that I've done it when I was a child. But yeah, what's your yeah. favourite chilling actually? Well, Fillet. the crunchy, I've never had it before, but the chocolate spread that I had yesterday was really good. I had that mm. with some bananas. It was very yeah. nice. Yeah. Did you do something with your flatmates? Uh, yeah, helped them out. That's really bit. good, yeah. yeah. Okay, firstly, this week marks Eating Disorder Awareness Week. Our reporter Jen Smith found out more. It's kind of like having a mind that's kind of split. So one side's like a bully. And it's not like you don't hear like a different person or anything, it's you. But one side of your mind's going, I know this is wrong, but the other side is so strong. Vicky Mella has been suffering with anorexia for the past two years. She's too anxious to speak on camera, but she wants to raise awareness of poor eating disorder services on the NHS. Vicky's mum remembers that first appointment they got with the Child Mental Health Services, CAMS, after weeks of pleading for help. And at the end of the hours assessment, she said to me, yes, um, I think Vicky does need to be seen and we'll send out an appointment in six weeks. And I said, well, at the rate we're going, that's really not going to be good enough for Vicky. You know, she'll, she will have collapsed by then. And she went, well, yes. So what you need to do is pack a bag, keep it in your car, like remember when you were pregnant, and it's a hospital bag. And then when she collapses, you go to A&E. Sam believes that if Vicky received treatment when they asked for it, then what followed may never have happened. Vicky's kidneys began to fail. She'd lost so much weight she had to be fed through a tube and she spent two months in hospital. A hospital where none of the staff were trained in eating disorders. The charge nurse was one of the worst nurses I've come across. He came in twice with a tray of food and put it in front of Vic and said, eat it. And I remember looking at him saying, well, if it was that easy, do you think we'd be here? And he just turned around and walked off. So he had no empathy at all. I think we've also got a lot of work to do around stigma because there are, there are many stories that I hear that are around the way that people are treated on inpatient units. So medical units, for example, where um, nurses and doctors aren't trained around eating disorders and they're, they're treated emotionally, um, like they're being a nuisance often. Eating disorders have the highest mortality rates of any mental illness in the UK and yet a survey carried out by the country's leading eating disorder charity found that 40% of patients, just like Vic, were told that their BMI was too low to receive treatment quickly and 20% of patients had to wait longer than six months just to receive an assessment. That it's all you can think about because it's there, you can't just switch off or take it away, it's just always there in your mind. It's kind of like having... Now, millennial generation, generation that is living in financial crisis and is experiencing money troubles. I went out to find out more. Student debt, unpredictable job market, rising house prices, issues that young people are facing today. Survey shows that young people aged 20 to 34 are still living with their parents than 20 years ago. So we find that people are living for today as opposed to living for tomorrow. The house prices have risen. We have to accumulate much more to get a deposit as well. And also, the criteria for mortgages are slightly more difficult as well because it's now based on affordability, whilst previously was predominantly on the basis of an income multiple. In the past, people were able to buy houses with relative ease because parents and grandparents were able to pass an inheritance which paid for a deposit to buy a house. So suddenly we are moving from a generation where house buying was easy to a generation where house buying is becoming a complete luxury. Young people are worse off financially than they were 10 years ago, but does it worry current young generation or not? Um, yeah, it does a little bit. I mean, I'm lucky enough to be able to live with my partner, but I've got lots of friends who are still living with their parents. Of course it worries me. It's, it's scary to be independent, but I try to relax, not to worry, not to overthink, and just be grateful for today. In the long term, I, 
like to be at a point where I can support myself and uh, hopefully my degree will lead into a job that can do that because I don't know where I'd be able to get money. The starting point is to spend less than you earn. If you first prioritize saving at least 10 percent you get into a mindset where you develop this ability to start prioritizing saving, building wealth as opposed to becoming a victim of the financial system. Becoming financially independent is more difficult than ever, but there is a hope for an improvement. Nikola Bartoshova, Keys News. That was very interesting stuff. It must have been really interesting to speak to all those people and find out their fears about the future. Definitely. He had a really good answer, this financial expert. Yeah. He talked about this 10% to save. Basically, he said, spend less. Yeah. You know, you have to you have to work with that. And he had really good answers with everything and I really enjoyed doing this package. Yeah. Did you find that most of the young people they were really worried about it? Yeah, yeah, quite a lot of young people are worried about yeah. that future. Was there anyone who wasn't worried? Yeah, this this girl then um called Darby, she wasn't worried really. She she looked up to the future and hopes that it will be okay, which is great. That's what you should be doing. It's definitely nice to look to the future. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Okay, that's great. After nearly twenty years, the artists of Rogue Studios are set to leave the historic Crusader Mill. Carl Bishop went to check out their latest public event, Rogue Cinema. This historic Manchester mill has been the home to Rogue Artist Studios for almost 20 years. The studios have enabled almost 100 local artists to gain both national and international interest. However, following the multi-million pound sale of the mill and its planned redevelopment into premium apartments, Rogue Studios has been forced to relocate. These old mills that have been converted into studios are, are really key for, for the emerging art scene because they're affordable spaces to work and they also allow relationships to be made and they allow for artists to make connections with other artists and yeah, I think they're, they're really important. With the artists set to leave in May, the public has one last chance to celebrate 20 years of creativity. As a last goodbye to a space which has fostered so much creative energy, Rogue Studios is currently hosting a month-long pop-up cinema meant to showcase both local and international talent. I'm here to speak to event organiser Sam Meach and today's featured film programmer Chris Diamond. So last week was the first event and we had two artists projecting uh, very abstract 16 millimeter animated work, sort of painted on film, um, and we had 20 people. So a Saturday night, 20 people decided not to just go into town, but to come and see some artist film. Tonight, we've already sold 40 tickets. Well, this is, <laughs> I was expecting like five people, and we're gonna have at least 45, I think, by the end of the night. Finding space which is affordable to create public events is I think that's needed you know for communities for cities so to to lose it is tough it's a big challenge so yeah hopefully it, it looks like we might have a next step but it won't be as close to the city center but that you know that's the city's loss isn't it you know collective spaces like these um, are just so essential, so essential to any kind of artistic vibrancy. You have so many artists in this space, you know, regardless of me not being included in that, you have so many artists in this space. Um, and that's how movements happen, that's how ideas are cultivated in spaces like this. Rogue Cinema is ongoing until March 18th. And as for the artists themselves, they are optimistic about the future of Rogue Studios. There's a lot more space in the place we might be going, so I think the scope for doing outdoor work and also the scope to maybe make a difference in a different community is really good. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited for the move. Carl Bishop, Keys News. And now to Gerard with the latest port. Thanks, Nicola. Now, our reporter Joseph Crabtree spoke to former Salford Red Devils player Adam Sidlow after the world's first transatlantic sports team match in the surprising location of Halifax.
I got a little taste of home when I went to St. Lawrence's Gaelic Football Club to see how the sport, the sport has spread to Manchester. This is mine. That's not mine. This is the lovely That's scene of you there, Chris. That's not mine, no. Back to you. Apologise. And what, what are we going on to after that? Apologies for that. Apologies for that. Sorry. Um, that uh, on. <laughs> I visited St Lawrence's Gaelic Football Club to get a little bit of taste at home. Ireland, a mix of football and rugby, which may seem odd to the average Briton. Both immigrants at all four corners of the globe, this Irish sport has spread worldwide, including Manchester. St Lawrence's GAA club is just one of five Gaelic football clubs here in Manchester and they compete against other teams throughout Lancashire and the UK. Well the club was founded in 1981, uh, way back then, so it was really started up by, by four Irish men who, who wanted their children to play GAA. Uh, so they started up as an underage club uh, and within a year we were playing senior football. There's quite a few competitions. We, there's the Lancashire League, so there'll be five Manchester clubs in that, plus the two two Liverpool clubs, and then we, we'd play in a Pennine League also. It's very competitive, put it like that, where we're trying to recruit players. You've got five clubs here in Manchester, and so we're all going after those same Irish-born players who are coming over on the planes and off the boats, so it can get quite quite competitive, and, uh, and you just you really got to sell yourself and make the most of it through social media, through websites and, and things like that. The squad is made up of a mixture of nationalities, with some Irish as well as some homegrown British players. I'm originally from Oma in County Truon. I've been over in England since 2006, uh, studying in Liverpool for five, six years, and recently moved to Manchester, uh, where I got involved with St Lawrence's. It's a real good club and it's a good way of making friends. As you expect, most of the boys are Irish, but uh, recently, last year, our, our club captain, Owen Watts, was uh, Manchester-born, but ironically, he's gone to Belfast to study, so we're missing him at the moment. I was born in Manchester, just down the road in Chorlton. Um, played for St Lawrence's probably since, played under age since about under 10s probably. Um, fam, family's from Leitrim and Wexford, so that's how I got into it really. Of course you'll get some other nationalities as well. We've had uh, a few Australians, who obviously I think it's quite similar to Aussie rules. You've come along and played it as well, so you'll get quite an eclectic mix of, of, of players. It seems that the sport of Gaelic football is thriving here in Manchester, bringing a taste of the Emerald Isle to the rainy city. Jared Mannion, Keys News. Now then, sorry about that little technical delay. I'll tell you, I'll be fired for next week, hey? But look, that's live TV. Anyways, that's all for sport this week. Tune in next time. We'll have the men's and women's football teams in the lead-up to their varsity competition. Back to you, Nicola. Thanks, Gerard. Now let's see what Doc's got with the latest weather. Well, it's the 1st of March, and it's, it's been sunny this morning, but as we all know, this is Manchester. doesn't stop like that for too long. And later today, there'll be cloud and rain like that for the rest of the week and Saturday but brightening up Sunday so it'll be all nice for the Once Upon a Smile charity event half past two at the AJ Bell Stadium. This is Doug Roweth for Keys News. I have no clue what happens. That's it for today's news. Keep up to date with latest news, entertainment and sport on keysnews.net. And follow us on social media at, at keysnews. Thank you very much Thank and goodbye. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.